found five of the Tata Steel Chess Masters. And most interestingly and importantly, we have a match between Carlsen and his second, Daniel Dubov. And if you know those two, you know that they'll have some very peculiar battles. Why? Because Daniel Dubov is a known to be a very creative, active player and a big connoisseur of the Sveshnikov defense. And if you have followed the recent World Championship matches, especially the one between Carlsen and Karyakin and the Carlsen Corona matches, it was very important to see how these opening struggles shape up, especially in the Carlsen Caruana one. Carlsen used the Sveshnikov defense to defend the black pieces and sometimes even to take some chances to win the game. Now let's take a look. That game. Wrong one. Masters. Let's look at this game. By the way, if you're just joining, don't hesitate to tell me in either chat, either the main channel chat um, on the Lee Chess broadcast or on the Chess Weep channel to ask away which game you're most interested in. So let's go back a few moves before we plunge in deep. So here, White sacrificed the pawn in hopes to continue playing. So we start from this position. White just recently got his knight to c4, played bishop e3. And seemingly this is um, quite nice for White because you have so many targets. But in compensation for that, Black has pressure with the bishop pair. And even though this bishop is passive, it stares at the e5 pawn, it actually is very useful. Once, once white tries to take the e5 pawn, this bishop becomes a monster and fairly useful, even in an attack. So Dubov is trying to open it up, and he's kind of inviting Carlsen to take, take, and then any of these breaks will either get an attack on the other side of the board, or black will get some play on the queen side. Queen e6. So the computer suggested a simple move of bishop d2, fe. You can take with the pawn because you're overloaded. Rook takes e4, and boom, gf. And this is actually a typical sacrifice that you see often in what we call the dragon variation. It, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily losing this position for white. The fact is that your king is so weak that there's enough play here for black. So here, instead of going bishop d2, not fancying defense, he decided to give up a pawn. Fe. Now de obviously is not an option because you don't have enough defenders on this knight. Knight d2, e takes, c takes d3. And you might ask what is the point of this? A, he, he did not allow rook f3, gf3 structures, b, he had some other, other ideas. Let's say if black would have taken on c4, queen c4, takes, knight takes c4. Maybe you could even consider dc, fixing these pawns on the black squares and such, and playing for that e4 square. But you could just do knight takes c4, and this is kind of the whole concept what Carlsen has in mind, most importantly, the fact that this knight will be cursed to defend all of those dark squared pawns because this knight is putting constant pressure on both of them. You don't really want to move it because I can remaneuver it and take on c5. So even though white is up, I mean, white is down a pawn, there's definitely a lot of compensation here. Hey, chat. Hi, Evan Star. How's it going? 
So at this moment, this would give a lot of play for Carlson, and probably he was hoping that this would happen. But as we can see, as we can see, this did not happen. Dubov immediately played e4. e4 being the idea that, okay, I don't want to be up upon with a terrible bishop on g7. I'd rather have two active bishops and put pressure on these guys instead of suffering. The knight takes e4, bishop c4, queen c4, queen d5. And this is the big, big difference. You don't have this really bad blocking pawn in front of that bishop anymore and knight e5 is coming and that means that the ones so passive pieces on d7 and g7 are coming alive knight e5 is very annoying and suddenly these pieces on e3 and e4 are not as active as they were before hello there palim how's it going we're just looking at the game between Carlsen, Car uh, Carlsen and Dubov, that is. And even though we're ch uh, looking at this game, if, we're, if you have an interesting game in mind, do let me know. I'd be happy to check it out as well. So knight e5 is coming. Rook takes, rook takes. Queen c2, knight e5, rook d1, rook d8. So Dubov is spending a lot of time, because this was kind of new to him, but I feel that he achieved a lot. This pawn structure, which was once upon a time very weak because of this knight c4 plans, now is not weak at all. In fact, that seems like a vice, because d4 ideas don't really work, because I have c takes. But I, actually, let's see. So d4. C takes, bishop takes. So what I see here is that maybe C takes is not the biggest problem. Maybe knight f7 is. Banking on the fact that this is a pin. Because if takes, I can take with the rook and even take with the bishop because you don't have this check idea because at the end you have knight f6 check. Forking and you can't really take it because your queen is pinned as well. Hello there, Acid House, Thomas Trainson. How am I doing? Doing good, doing good. So, probably rook d4 is bad on account of knight f3 because this works now. There's no more pin, there's no knight f6. And white is just suffering here. But d4 is still an interesting idea. Here, 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 here. You attack me, you try to enforce this. But I can go knight c3, defending, attacking the queen, defending my rook. And probably I can make a bishop move next. Is this better for white? I doubt it. But is this tenable and do you have enough counterplay? More than certain. More than certain. So d4 is an option. What else? So in these types of positions where the weakness is on b6, typical breaks are d4 and b4. b4 actually don't think works. I could go c4 or even just take and go b3 and suddenly this pawn becomes monstrous. You can't even stop me. A, I think I could take on d3 and here I have knight f4, double attacking, actually triple attacking because the g2 is also hanging. Or just go b2, which is a taboo for you, because knight f3 is coming, gf, and your queen is dropping. If takes here, queen is gone, because it's a check. So, non, not, not b4 and not d4, 
neither of them really seem to work that well. And that is actually big news. You would kind of expect that to be a trouble, but I have that feeling that this is not going to be such a big deal. I have this feeling that B4 and D, if B4, D4 doesn't really work, I feel that Dubov is fine. Although just look at the clock, Dubov burned a lot of time. And even though he, I think most of his pieces are well coordinated, I feel that the fact that he has 30 minutes against an hour might count at the end. It depends though if Kozen can keep this game going. Yes, Thomas Trainstone. In fact, I think giving up this pawn was not just tricky, but a little dubious. He just wanted to continue with the game. But okay, it's still a balanced position, and we're, we're still awaiting what happens. But okay, let's go to the Fabi game. As I was asked in chat, Asset House is asking, Hi, Dinesh. Hi all, Karana von Forest is interesting, and indeed it is. So, interestingly enough, White played this very weird plan of knight h4 and this d3 break, knight g4, castle g5, and that's why you don't put your knight on the rim, because it can get captured quickly. You can go knight f5, and you can go back because the pawn will take you. So de, gh, bishop f4. Takes, takes. This is obviously computer preparation by both sides. So, yes, putting the knight on the rim is dim, but if you know what you're doing, sometimes you're forgiven. And I can say that probably Fabi is forgiven because he's going to get lots of central pawns, bishops that fire through the board and also the black king cannot really find a real panacea even if it castles if that king goes castling it is still not that good so bishop d6 queen d3 and you might ask why didn't fabi take on d5 or knight d5 or queen d5 well the answer is the following so white can take on d5 anytime he'd like to but also be kind of playing against black's development so whenever we just capture a pawn that's kind of a non-move you do get an extra pawn but you don't get extra mobility for your pieces therefore fabi plays queen d3 preparing the rook to join the attack on the d file bishop g3 queen g3 now, castles is not a move, because you would just run into a pin and lose the knight. And if you lose that extra knight, you're just gone for. It's nothing that you could do here. Hello there, El Rosador. So, castles is not an option anymore, and that's a good sign for Fabiano. If black is stuck in the center, white has an initiative against the king, then that looks pretty good. Bishop e6, e takes, bishop c8. So this looks like a funny maneuver, but von Forrest's point is, okay, I want to solidify my position. Decide, Fabi, are you going to take my pawn or will you let me play d4? So Fabi decides, okay, I'll take your pawn because I'm going to win some time on your bishop. Bishop c8, knight b5 threatening both knight c7 and knight d6. And to be honest with you, whenever I look at this position, I'd rather be white than black. Yes, black has the extra piece, but it just doesn't feel right. You've been wasting a lot of moves going back and forth. You have a loose knight on g4. It's not that black doesn't have chances, but I do feel that this should be deadly. This attack should be deadly, as white needs only two moves to develop all of his pieces for the attack. Yeah, Elevan 2k, I kind of agree with you. I think bishop e6 and bishop c8 is a little bit too much. It's pushing it. 
Moriori Invictus, this is live. This is live. Yeah, so rook c1, rook d1 is coming. That's going to be a big problem. El Rosadler, why bishop e6 in the first place? Well, the problem for black is, as I said before, you can castle because h3 and you lose the knight because of the pin. Otherwise, if you go, let's say, d4, I jump to d5, win the tempo, get a mighty beast on that central square, h3 is coming. Let's say knight a6. I still have h3. Excuse me. And when your knight moves, I have queen e5 check and you're done. Because I'm going to either take on f6 or call the arbiter because you're checked. You've got to block it and I just take. So Von Forest is trying to stop white from getting the knight to d5. Takes, takes. Knight b5. And that's why bishop e6. Bishop c8 happened. Knight a6, rook c1, bishop d7. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this one. So first moves that come to mind is knight d6 check. Just asking where this king is going and pick up the pawn. But that would definitely waste some time. Sometimes maybe even rook maneuvers could make sense. Either to join the attack from this way and kind of putting pressure on that knight. Now you can take on b5. I can actually throw in a check if I so want to. Go here. Queen a3 check. Let's say check. So if king d7, your king is likely to get mated. If you go king f8, I can check you and go take. And then again, mate is incoming. So rook c4, I think, would have been an interesting idea as well. But Fabi decides just to go the simple route. And just go knight d6 check, king f8. So I have a choice of taking on b7, but maybe I could also consider playing queen f4, putting pressure on the f7 pawn. Note that Fabiano Carano has 40 minutes and Fon Forest the same. I think in both cases, I think that Fabi is the one who's pressing here. Saki is asking, do you think white can win this? Definitely. The problem for black is that these knights are really horrible. They're not doing a great job. This knight is completely out of play on a6. And it's not likely that this knight will ever get an outpost on e5, which it would love to have. And the big problem is if Fabi can start pushing the e-pawn, there's no stopping that. And then black just gets destroyed. But okay, let's try to find a plan here. So one of the ideas you could do is queen f4, queen f6, say takes, takes, knight b7. And even if I just decide to do this, this way of playing, I have three pawns for the piece, which is normally saying is just good enough. So that is like definite compensation that you're looking for. So even this is a reasonable choice for Fabiano, but he doesn't even have to do queen f4 because black is disorganized. As you've mentioned before, probably rook g8 is an idea for black to try to get some sort of activity. 
I'm kind of still set on this idea of rook c4. Still want to go to f4, put pressure on this square, on f7. And now at least my knight is not hanging. Put pressure here. I want this maneuver. What could you play? Even queen e7 doesn't do anything for you. I still have rook f4. And if you take, I have rook f7 and queen takes d6. So that is something of a problem. Let's say rook g8. Again, rook f4 kind of looks nasty. Knight e5. Maybe, maybe this time this actually looks like good play for black. Because suddenly there is play on my king. Which I don't enjoy. So maybe I should start with queen a3 first. Setting up ideas along this line. Queen e7. I might have rook e5 and f4. Here, here. Now you, if you have to move, I have some deadly checks. And if you block, I have f4. My, your bishop h3 idea doesn't work because my queen is a long range piece. Also, you're pinned. Knight f3 runs into ef. And most importantly, I take away your active plan of playing queen g5. Hello, residual inside. How's it going? So I feel that this rook c4 maneuver might be of interest. And in fact, I feel that this is better. Um, I like queen a3 better. So after queen e7, this one. So rook c4 was played. And uh, I guess I could pack pat myself in the back i feel but this is actually fairly logical to be honest with you you're bringing an extra piece to attack and also at some moments will be a helpful piece to defend along the fourth rank and then this idea is important so all in all this looks very dangerous thomas e4 hello there how's it going and by the way if you're just joining Hello and welcome, and Grandmaster Dennis Borosh. Here's our link. If you want to join us, there's our Discord and Facebook. But what I wanted to say is I'm just looking at the Fabiano Fun Forest game. But if you have a specific game in mind that you'd be interested to see, do let me know in the Lee Chess chat or the Chess Feep channels chat. Let me just see what has been said since. When does time controls kick in? Morion Victos is asking. Well, move 40. And we still move 19. That is not a good sign for fun for us, I don't think. 112K says, to kill your stapler, but I think it's an important point. I think Carlson will be happy to hold a draw. And I kind of agree. I think Dubov is doing fine. But okay, let's take a look back at that game. If rook g8, I still feel that this queen a3 idea is kind of annoying. Now note that computers might say that the position is equal, but in a practical game, things can happen. And so far, I can vouch for white definitely i feel that white is the one pressing and it's a little easier to play this even if the computer would say that it would hold okay let's go back to the Carlson game so since then, so knight e5 was played. Previously, Carlsen sacrificed a pawn for some positional play.
But then Dubov played this e4 move, which was a super good one. As I said before, Carlsen was hoping for a structure like this, where even though he's down a pawn, he has good pressure against these dark squared pawns. But black has bad pieces. But Dubov said, no, 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 I want a better bishop and not to be down a pawn. Takes. And now we got into this position. I was looking at b4, d4 breaks. None of that that seemed reasonable. Knight c3, queen d7. And now d4 actually doesn't work anymore. And I think this is in some ways admitting that this is not good for white. By the way, here's a link to the broadcast. You so want to check it out. Which opening this was from? It was the Rossolimo, and basically what was just trying to avoid the good old Sveshnikov that has been prepared by both of them, which might be surprising to you, as they've been preparing this together for the World Championship match, which featured Carlsen against Caruana. Dubov is well known to be the second of Magnus Carlsen, and that's actually why this game is so exciting and peculiar. Because Carlsen is actually playing against his own preparation, which is weird. How would you enjoy playing against your own preparation? I don't think very much. Killer Stapler is asking, what does a second do? Well, a second helps you to come up with ideas in the openings and such. And this is what happened here. Dubov is a big expert on the Sveshnikov, so he gave up ideas for Carlsen to play in his match. And this is why this is kind of weird and strange, because Carlsen is going to play against his very own preparation. b3, and this is a sad move. So white would love to play d4, but then takes. You can't even take with the rook. You've got to take with the bishop, but even that is sad, because check, takes, bishop takes d4. I have a mighty bishop lording down the board. And also, because you don't have any more knight e4, knight f6 tactical tricks, this is just bad for Carlsen. So knight c3, queen d7, b3. b3 is more of a defensive idea. So Carlsen is saying, please don't play c4. And make sure that that is well defended. So question number one. Can Dubov take on d3? That looks dangerous because you're pinned and... You're just walking into one. Knight d3. Probably I can go knight a4. So whenever your opponent is walking into a pin, always check if you can win immediately. Now that would involve my knight going to c1 or f4 to attack that d3 knight. Let's say knight e2. Is there any jumps? No, there's not enough jumps because I take both your queen and rook. Just to demonstrate, I'm up a rook. So that doesn't work. That's no good for you. I might want to stabilize with queen f5. And what's funny, even though you're pinned, your rook is pinned, it's not going to be a check, so I can greedily take on f4, or even go knight b4, but this is probably the better one. And queen f5, which would normally be the winning move because takes and takes, here runs into rook d1 check, and you're actually losing. You're actually losing here. So you can't punish me for taking, because I have queen f5. But you have knight a4, and again, my knight can't move. You can't play b5 because I take, and then 
my this my knight would be a taboo you can't take because rook takes and you're losing and other than that you have to move either your queen or rook but then your d3 knight is loose So he played queen f5, kind of rotating move orders, and that what makes super grandmasters great. They know that if they have an idea, they can switch it around. So he's trying to take with the rook instead. Now, if you would have take, played b5, then the c5 pawn is hanging. So these pawns are kind of stuck there defending each other. So queen f5 was played. Knight e4, just blocking the view of these guys. I'm not sure if this works actually. So sometimes there are some tactics like this. Whoa. So let's see, knight takes d3. You can take on d3 because queen takes e4, you're pinned. Therefore, you can't capture. Question number one, where can you bring your knight? Probably knight g3. I was thinking about knight b4 ideas, but it just doesn't work because of knight f5. So this would be beautiful. It just doesn't work. You can't take because your queen is hanging. You can't take with the queen because the same motif that I showed. But unfortunately, knight b4, knight f5, and when you take on c2, I take on d8. But again, Dubov re rejected that idea, played rook d5, preparing to go queen d7 and then take on d3. Even knight takes d3 is a bigger threat now. Let's see what Chet says. And Thomas Strainson is saying, I'm surprised Carlsen didn't drop a surprise on Dubov, Mora Gambit or Grand Prix attack. Yeah, actually that does make sense as he's walking deep into the Dragon's Lair. Yeah, Triple H, you're definitely correct. Those pawns on b6 and c5 are rather weak. Yeah, Queen f5 was a very strong move. I have to give it to him. That's a good move. So now black is threatening knight d3. Let's say wait. Knight takes d3. You can't take still same idea. And now as my queen is defending it from behind, it's no longer pinned and the next move is going to be knight b4. So this is a real threat. Probably f3 is the move. Stabilizing this knight and preparing knight f2. But to be honest with you, this does look like a sorry sight. And even if you don't see a clear win for black, it does make sense to continue. Queen d7, probably knight f2. And for the moment, white is holding, but uh, barely. Black is just holding all of his pieces together, but this is going to be a lots and lots of suffering. In fact, chat and viewers, what do you think? What will be the end result of this game? Meanwhile, I take a bit of a sip. That boy says draw. Okay. Carlson will hold. Vin Magnus, wow. Palam, draw. Draw. Yeah, um, Cousin has chances to hold. On the other hand, I feel that if Black squeezes a lot, could squeeze a lot out of this position. Let's say queen d7, knight f2, and now, does anyone remember a legendary player who played Karpov in the 90s? 
and won the World Cup sensationally after returning to chess. Can you recall that player? Hmm, what's his name? What's his name? Chad, can you help me? And he's a legend. Not any kind of a legend. So while Chet thinks about this very sneaky question of mine, White is actually stuck defending this pawn and can't really do anything active. So that would actually beg the question, how can White Black proceed in this type of positions? He is indeed the famous legend, Palem 89. So probably black could think about going king h8, go g5, and even have, as the famous legend would play, play g5, walk the king over to the other side, and start pushing on the king side. Maybe, maybe... Carlsen can think of f4 moves, but it is actually a viable plan, as I've seen in many Komsky games, to walk your king to the other side of the board and then do a pawn storm with g5, h5, and g4. Now, this might seem elaborate, and it is, but it is not something that black can't really do. Because as mentioned before, b4 is not working. Because C takes, takes B3, you move B2, and you can never capture this pawn because I have knight F3 ideas. Obviously, B2 is not forced. I can still start with rook B5 and then start pushing. And it's still clear that it is black who's trying to play for a win. So with B4 not on the cards, D4 is definitely not on the cards, the plan of walking the king over is not as strange as it might seem. What do I think the, end, uh, the outcome of this game will be? There's a chance of Carlsen holding, but if Duba really wants to try for a win, he can. Probably objectively he should. So by, by all means, I think that there's a chance that uh, Dubov can play for more. Is it up to Carlsen? Not at all. So... Let's leave this game for a moment and let's try to take a look at a different one. While we're waiting for moves, apart from the plan that I showed, the future plan, probably supported by bishop f6, hmm, which game should we take a look at? Evelyn Modified Dog, sure thing, sure thing. Let's take a look at this game between Anand and Jeffrey Jean. And you can see there's a raging attack on. Now I have to commend Jeffrey Jean for going for this line, but it's a little dangerous. You're not castling, although it's a close position, so maybe it could be forgiven. But with the bishop pair and an attack, Anand is a fierce competitor. So he plays h4, tries to attack, h5, queen d1, b6. Bishop g5, and immediately you can spot that maybe Jeffrey Zhang's idea of playing this variation was not well founded. Queen c7 takes c3, bishop a6. Jeffrey is trying to exchange off these bishops, so white won't have the bishop pair. And black's main hope is to somehow get into an endgame and target pawns on a2 and c3. On the other hand, at the moment, the king is very, very fragile in the center. 
So no wonder that Anand will put pressure on the h5 pawn and tries to open the position as quickly as possible. Knight b8, knight f4, hitting there. And when you see g6 coming in the French, and I still have that bishop near that f6 square, square that means nothing good for you. g4, h takes, queen takes g4, h5 is coming, and you can sense that Anand is not peaceful today. Knight d7, rook c1. Now you might think that knight d4 is in the air, but I have counter sacrifices, and I can just capture back with either the pawn or the queen. Probably the pawn, because now my rook is defended. Before you could capture there, but not anymore because of my bishop. And this is actually a classical double attack, which is near mating, because my because the e6 pawn is dropping and the king is just getting mated. So rook g8 was played trying to bring a defender closer to the king but this still looks mighty dangerous h5 g takes queen takes h5 queen c4 knight e2 knight e2 is a move to kind of defend these squares and maybe planning rook f3 pressuring the f5 knight now let's take a look at the clocks Jeffrey is not far behind in time, and that's a good news. And that might mean that Jeffrey might just as well survive. He has some pressure on the G file, so potentially, and maybe that's why Anand played knight d2, so there's no rook g1 checks, which could be very annoying. Because as long as the queen and the rook is involved in the, in the attack, this would be fairly good. Hello, Lilia Koridze. How's it going? Thank you so much. How was your streams? Or are you streaming today? So knight e2 is probably a defensive idea, stopping these rook g1 plans forever. Yeah, Thomas Strainson, I definitely agree. He is seemingly out for blood. Knight e2. On the other hand, knight e2 feels a little bit passive. The knight felt like it's really good there. So knight e2. Um, maybe king e8. So sometimes in these types of positions... You do plan to run away with your king eventually to the queen side. And maybe that could be the theme of this whole thing. This could be the theme of round five. Run your king to the other side of the board. Ah, oh, sure thing, Lila Koritze. Hope you'll have fun streams in the future as well. So, the king will run, and if... Jeffrey manages to evacuate his king to the queen side, then it'll be actually clean advantage black. Because look, there's weaknesses everywhere on the queen side. Even the f2 pawn is a little bit loose. And the only weakness left for black would be the f7 pawn. Yeah, but you can really fold that with knight f8, knight g6 maneuvers, and then just walk the king over to b7. Walking it over there to b7 while you get your knight to g6. So suddenly I have second thoughts. Maybe Jeffrey Zhang actually survived the hard moments and the hard part of the game. And suddenly the hunter might get hunted. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think, chat? Which side would you take?
white, still white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, knight e2, I'm not a fan. It's a bit too circumspect, too defensive, I feel. White. Okay. So, which game should we look at next? Let's take a look around. V2 of this looks fairly even. Even though white has the bishop pair, there's like a big D pawn. This kind of feels even. This looks wild. Let's stay at the Firuja game for a little bit. So this was the normal position. I think this is still a line in the classical orthodox systems. And e4 is coming. So white is playing against black center and weak structure. On the other hand, black has the bishop pair. And that can get really annoying. King h8, e4 d4 and now the question is whether this pawn will become a vice or a weakness now anish has enough defenders but eventually i can put enough pressure on this pawn that you might have to play c5 and i can get my knight to d5 and that would change the situation also note that i have a majority on the king side and again if i could manage to play f4 e5 this would be advantage white. So knight f4, trying to put pressure on this pawn and also reorganizing his pieces. So, um, knight e2 is coming, bishop e5. The point is you can't really take, because I have ideas, queen h4 ideas, and dc. So if you take, I have queen h4. If you drop back, then this pony gets it. If you don't drop back, then you either get mated or the h5 pony gets it. So knight d3, it's a very nice little intermezzo. You could take on h2, but then even though you kind of solidified your structure, your king side is still kind of a wreck. And I might be able to punish you eventually with some rook maneuvers. So you might not want that to happen. Ship g7, knight e2, knight d4. Evelyn, modified dog, I will answer your question. I just want to take a look at this Firuja game for a second. So bear with me. Knight e2. White is pl planning either to push f4, e5, that is plan number one, but could also have ideas of knight g3 and h5. Not really knight f5, because my bishop will always take you. So, knight e2, h4, stopping that idea. But... And this is kind of the reason and norm why you play these plans. You're suggesting that I, I might go knight g3, attack your pawn on h5, and go knight f5. You just lure your opponent to playing h4, and then you say, haha, that was never my plan. h3, queen e7, e5, rook d8. So in some respect, this is the way you win some tempi in high-level chess. You kind of pretend that, oh, I'm going to play knight g3, knight h5. Then they waste the move playing h4, and then you say, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I'm still going to play in the center instead. 
to e5. On the other hand, I'm not a fan of this e5 move, although it was kind of forced. Anish put pressure on that e4 pawn. f3 would be a little ugly. Note that still there could be some play against our king if we're playing too slow. But with e5 then, this gave away the square on f5, which can become annoying for white. So rook d8. That didn't work at the moment because bishop f5 I could take on d4. Takes, rook takes. And this would actually in turn into a position that is favorable for white. Why? Well, you have a wreck of a pawn structure. And if you take, I will have pressure on that pawn. Double my pawns. Double my pawns? Double my rooks, excuse me. And I will have good pressure on your position. So whenever you have the bishop bear, you really don't, don't want to give it away, especially now because it's compensating for your wrecked pawn structure. So Giri is planning to get the bishop out to f5 and then put pressure on the e5 pawn and the d3 knight. Maybe even in the long term, some rook maneuvers with rook g8 and rook g2. Hello there, Evelyn's, Evelyn Vo and Evelyn's Modified Dog. So, we've been looking at some games already, but hello everyone who's just joining. I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borosh, and I'm going to look at the Cousin game that we've been looking before. I'm going to go back there. Wow, so many things happened. Okay, let's track back, because we stopped right here. Rook d5 and knight c3. So I was actually suggesting f3, but probably was a little bit too passive for cause and taste, and I could agree. Because queen d7, knight f2, and that's kind of the only way you could defend. And um, then you would be just stuck. And the maneuver I kind of suggested here for black was to just to move the king away. Prepare g5 and even walk the king to the other side. And this could make sense. But knight c3 is an interesting idea, saying, I'm willing to part with this d pawn, but in exchange, I want to jump at your weaknesses on b6 and c5. And probably this is the best move possible. And now I think it is going to be going and getting into some trouble. By the way, I did want to mention, I'm looking at this game between Kozin and Dubov, but if you have a game that you find very interesting and that piques your interest, do let me know in the Lee Chess chat or the Chess Weep channel chat. Do these guys make mistakes? Yes, they do. So Rook takes d3, Dubov is getting into the end game. Now, even if knight d3, I have knight a4, and you can't really defend that b6 pawn while defending your knight on a d3 as well. So queen takes d3, takes, takes, knight a4, c4, just getting rid of that pawn. And this is the method that Dubov has been following all game long. He's been given up pawns to activate pieces. C4 is again that method. He's trying to get rid of the B pawn with BCB5, therefore eliminating Cousin's pawns and try to push this B pawn as long as he can. So C takes, C takes, Knight C5. But Cousin is trying to exchange everything off before it's too late. Knight takes, Bishop takes C5. Now the question is if you can promote in due time. But I think you can't. If you go bishop c3, I'll walk my king to d3 and we'll stop you before promotion. So king f1, b4, here, 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 b2, and my king arrives here in due time. And I just pick up the pawn and white is never in danger. In fact, he is the one slightly more preferred in these type of positions. The king g8, the king 
is the ruler of the end games. It's the best piece ever. So you want to have them activated. King f1, king f7, they're just bringing their kings in, bishop b4. And it's still kind of uncomfortable for Carlsen because he's not the one with the passer. So Dubov is still pressing a little bit, even though objectively I don't think that this should be a big trouble to hold. In fact, one plan is to play with f5, get rid of the g pawn. And then you can even sacrifice the bishop. Bishop d4, f4. That is actually Carlsen's plan. Bishop c5, bishop d2, bishop f8, g4, b4, h4. So as long as black will exchange off the g6 pawn, this position is drawn, even though you win this bishop. Only thing left need to, that I need to do is just to get my king in the corner and the game ends in a draw. Note that king c3 would be a terrible mistake here. And it is funny because this move and this position would remind me of the reverse of the so Wesley Firuja game. So it's white who played king c3, but it's black to move and win. And as I can see, they're speeding towards a draw. The so king e4, bishop g7 does make sense, but there's a killer blow here that just wins on the spot. And that move is bishop b4 check. And yeah, you could stop that pawn, but then I take your bishop on d2. And if you take here b2 and bye-bye as my pawn is promoting. So this is one of those tactical ideas. Again, you should remember, because sometimes you can swindle your game, swindle and win your game this way. But okay, uh, h5 was played, gh, bishop takes b4, and now the game is drawn, and they agreed to a draw, because king e3 takes king e3, the king will get into the corner, and with the h-pawn, with the wrong color, is considered a draw, therefore they agreed here to draw. Let's go to the Caruana Fun Forest game. So we've been following this one. We actually predicted rook c4 with the plan of rook f4 and ideas such as rook f4 and even queen a3. So as I showed before, rook g8, queen a3, we actually predicted all of this. Now king g7 is a pretty good move, trying to hide the king away. But even if Black manages to get that king away, White still has a huge initiative. Now if queen e7, we talked about this before, but let me show it again. Then rook e4 would break the, this defense. The queen would have to move as knight e5 would run into f4, defending against potential queen g5 attacks and also attacking, oh, also attacking the g5 square. Note, you don't have bishop h3 because my queen would take you. And that would lead to a sad affair. So Dubov is not winning. Dubov just had a little bit of a chance there. But obviously the position was considered dead drawn. So king g7, rook f4 was played. The point is, white is trying to put pressure on f7 before black could consolidate. Knight e5, trying to get this knight to an active square. Queen c3, pinning. Queen g5, rook f3, king f8, queen e7. So in fact, this plan did not 
pan out too well for Fun Forest because now it's not on H8 where it wanted to be, but on F8. And this Rook F3, Rook G3 maneuver was kind of a high class plan, probably missed by Fun Forest. Let's say if you go here, I can go Rook G3, and then I have F4, FE ideas, which is kind of nasty when you look at this type of positions. So rook g3, that, therefore he decided to avoid that diagonal, queen e7, knight takes b7. And I said this before when I was looking at this position and said that even if I just capture pawns, white should be doing, well, probably h takes or queen takes if you want to put pressure. Because even then, my pawn count is kind of high. I have three pawns. Wait, is it three pawns? Yes, it's three pawns for the piece, and that piece is an a6 knight. So actually you have three pawns for something pretty bad. So, in this type of position, And h takes was taken. Now, sometimes we consider f takes as well. And here's the reason why this didn't happen. Is this going to be a dangerous attack? No, it's not likely to happen. And you would also weaken this diagonal. Therefore, we reject f takes g. If this would have been an aggressive attack and a winning one, we would take that way. But naturally, we want to take towards the center, and this will provide a lift for the king and will help me pushing the pawns with e4 and f4. Also note that f4 kind of has this pseudo threat of chasing this knight away. You don't have active moves such as knight g4 plus queen h8 checkmate. So let's leave this position for a while. I think that white should be the one pressing with f4 lingering in the air and d6 coming. And because of that knight and the fragile king, I feel that it is still Fabi to push. But let's come back to the Anand Jeffrey Jean game. Here, so modified asked, Evelyn modified dog asked. King e8, what if queen h7? Well, then your bishop is hanging on g5, so you can't really do that. Here I kind of changed my mind, and after knight e2, I felt that definitely, definitely, Jeffrey's situation is improving, in fact, can possibly play for a win. Why? Well, just like as I suggested in the previous game, this king can hopefully walk to b7. And that is not a far, as far-fledged as you might think. And if Jeffrey manages to walk his king over to b7, the weaknesses on the queen side will tell. And actually, it is going to be Jeffrey who is going to be playing for a win. By the way, Trigamini, thank you for following. Also, if you're new to this channel, feel free to check out our Discord and join us there if you so like. So knight e2, rook c8, same move, rook f3, rook c6, kind of over defending, creating some safe space for the king in the future, knight g3, and now king e8. In fact, I still don't know why he allowed this. Probably takes, 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 and the idea is rook g6. If queen h7, that g5 bishop is still hanging, and if I can destabilize your rook and my rook gets to go to g1, then it is definitely Jeffrey who's playing for a win. Also, some sometimes that knight can maneuver to e6 and break open the g file. King e8, probably this is the big plan to rook, rook g6 and double. And yes, white will be up a pawn, but there's not much that he could do about it. 
and do with it in general. And again, while we're looking at this game, chat and Lee chess chat, hello, do tell me if there's a game that would fancy your interest. Thank you for the follow, Brahim Lipe. So I do feel that uh, Jeffrey should be doing fine here. Rook takes would be interesting, but I don't think it's with ideas of knight d6. But I doubt that this is too good. With an active queen like this, I don't think that this is enough. Let's say queen d3. Knight d6 takes takes queen f5. Oh, queen f5, queen e2, check. Be queen e4, and king b2. Hmm. Let's see. So knight f5. For some reason, I don't believe this. Probably. May, what about the counter sack? So if d, I check you. Bishop e3, I can start attacking. Rook c3. Here and I have this pressure. You don't have f4 because your your knight is hanging now. It's not defended, and your queen is pinned. So naturally, this did not happen. Knight f5 happened. E f rook f5. Okay. So this is a big threat. You have to avoid that. So rook c g6 is predicted happened, and I don't know. What do you think, chat? Who's going to win this game? Queen h7, I can just still take there. Takes, takes. Always have knight f8 blockades. So let's say here. This is just a check. I'll hide. Doesn't really matter. And if you take, take. Queen h8, I have knight f8 blocking. How's Firuja doing? Okay, we'll take a look at after that one. So g6, king d2. All right. So probably walking away from these rook g1 ideas. Queen a2, I can always block with rook c2. Knight f8, knight e6. So knight f8, knight e6 seems to make a lot of sense. On the other hand, even though black is consolidating, it feels that white is not going to get checkmated. And if white doesn't get checkmated, um, that pawn sack is not that good. Here... Could maybe even go rook c2 just to defend against ideas. And if knight e6, just bishop f6. So, I don't know. Definitely Jeffrey is still in the game, but uh, not certain. But let's take a look at Firuja's game. Ooh, it's heating up. Knight e2, h4, queen e7, e5. We left it off here. So black decides to play rook d8. Defending the d4 pawn and planning bishop f5. And I have a feeling that this game is going to be spicy. f4, bishop f5. And suddenly, as you don't have enough pressure on d4 and your pawns are not mobile enough anymore. So when the pawns are e4 and f4, the chance that you could move them frontal like a tank that was great but now you're stuck and i will be the one pressing you with c5 c4 king h2 queen e6 and just look at the time actually anish has more time than firuja does 
Again, queen e6 is a blockading move, hitting the a2 pawn, putting some pressure here, and this is still on the cards. Knight g1. But uh, Firuja is not giving up. He's remaneuvering this bad knight from e2 to f3, so he could put pressure on h4 and on d4. Bishop h6. And this is a typical fight between grandmasters. So a grandmaster would note that this knight on e2 is terrible. It does attack on d4, but it literally doesn't do anything else. This f4 pawn is well defended. So it says, okay, I'll go knight g1 and activate it. I want to bring it to f3 and just make a better piece of this. And then Anish says, okay, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to play knight f3, gonna play bishop h6. So if you dare play knight f3, I'm going to take that because you're pinned. You can't capture back. I mean, actually that doesn't work. So Firuja says, haha, you're wrong. I don't care about this because this doesn't actually work. I can take on e6. And if you take here, rook takes d1. I have two pieces and an extra passer. I'm the one playing for a win, putting pressure on all of your pawns and the rook on d8. I'm the one who's playing for a win here. So knight f3 is kind of saying, I don't trust your ideas, Mr. Anish Giri. I am still going to play knight f3 and follow along with my plan. Now Anish might have realized that bishop f4 is not good, but that's not the only way to play here. Especially bishop d3 is an idea, and now bishop f4, as far as I can see, is a viable option. Question is how should we take back? Probably with the queen, because we want to have some at attacking prospects on the queen side, I mean on the king side. The bishop f4 is a check, so you have to react. You move it to the white square, so this bishop cannot bother you. But then again, at least white activated his pieces and this knight is much better. Is this enough? I have doubts. I think this is still a huge advantage for Anish Giri. Because I have a potential plan and I don't really see your counterplay coming from white. Even though knight h4 is annoying. If bishop g3, that would run into knight g5, this double threat, and actually it's a triple threat, because if you go queen g6, I have knight f7, forking you, and then you're dying. It's knight f7, and I take that rook, and actually it is white who's playing for the win. The bishop g3 is a no-go. You can't really take because of the same idea, which is quite annoying. Maybe queen h6 is an option. Defending this pawn, and if knight d4, bishop e5, putting pressure on this guy. So Anish decided that, okay, I'm not going to even enter that one. I'm going to play queen e7. Point could be that he's still planning to take, but he's not going to tell when. And at the moment, Giri has... 22 minutes against 14. That's very interesting. If you, I go queen d2, you can still take. If I go knight e1, I defend everything, but that would be extremely passive. So white needs to look for a move that makes sense. Now queen f2 makes sense attacking this guy, but then I take, take, and you'd run head into either bishop g3 or bishop e3, and after c5, I have a humongous advantage. I defend this very important pawn, and I can start preparing pawn pushes. Why does time always seem to melt away during a chess game, ask, ask raise the curve? Well, because you need to be precise and you want to pose as much of a pressure on your opponent as possible. 
So that's why I think queen e7 was a pretty good move, keeping the tension, keeping the bishop pair. And now, Firuja actually has a difficult choice to make. And I'm not quite sure what white should be doing here. Maybe king h1. Because in this case, if you take, we transpose back to the line that we've looked at, bishop f4. I don't have any jumps. Hoping to find some jumps here, but I don't think there's any. So right now, actually, I feel Anish is still in the driver's seat. And this looks kind of annoying. Vesli so drew against Kovalyov. Let's take a look at... Let's check back to the Karwana game. There have been some moves being played. Rook g3, h takes, rook c8. Chasing this queen away from a perfect position. Queen e3. Sneakily staring at both sides of the board. Knight g4. And if you take... I can possibly go knight c5. But I don't know. Queen a7, maybe queen e2. So if queen a7, there's queen e2. And black would get good counterplay against the white king. And with an extra piece, if you're attacking with an extra piece, that's usually a good sign. So Fabi played queen, queen f4. If queen e2, I have bishop f3, double attacking the queen and the knight. So I have queen d6 ideas afterwards hitting on that bishop. So say here check now you got to defend this bishop but if you go there then rookie one and you're gone you're a goner this is not good for you knight g4 queen f4 queen e5 and that's a pretty good move by fun forest he is trying to get into the end game which would maybe be minimally better if better at all for fabi So Grand Lapine is asking question if the draw could be held. That's a good question. So now I could exchange on e5 or avoid exchange with queen d2. If queen d2 first question I have is will this knight fall? Probably it won't because anytime you attack it, I can a go knight a5 and head towards c6. B, I can also play d6, activating my bishop and pushing my passer. Both sound like a proper idea. Also note that this bishop is an important defender. If you ever do this, I can even fancy promoting that d-pawn. So queen d2 is an option. Knight c5, probably queen b4, and I can pin you. That's kind of annoying. Kiedu is saying, funnily enough, this knight on g4 is still, still glued to that square. That's true. Also, yeah, I just about forgot about this, this one. This would be very annoying. Probably that's the reason you don't play queen d2. And played bishop f3 instead. Hmm. Maybe, maybe there'll be a turn in this game. Chat, what do you think? Will Fabi be the one struggling for a draw? Or nah, still Fabiano is still going to win this game. Bishop f3. So white is hoping to eliminate that aggressive knight. Hmm. So even this is somewhat interesting. Ah, but that would drop the knight. So here I can take. And whichever way you take doesn't matter. I check you and then grab that a6 pony. But... While we speak, 
Van Forest took on f4, played rook c2, and this can be annoying because as Forest will start taking pawns, Caruana will have to muster up a plan to a either avoid losing the queenside pawns or start pushing his pawns himself. So maybe maybe this kind of gone astray a little bit. Rook b1, so Fabi is trying to cling to the pawns. So knight b4 would be interesting, but then I just kick you out. Hmm. Knight f6, probably I have e4, pressing and pushing my pawn forward. If not for e4, I'm planning to plant my bishop on f5. And then I might have pressure on the d5 pawn with rook d2 and on b2. Maybe that's even better. Thinking rook d2. Idea being, I want to play bishop f5. If you play e4, then my knight is still on g4 attacking that critical f2 pawn. Then your king can become really weak. Also, bishop f5 would be coming, forcing e4 maneuvers, and then I can play against clear targets. But Forrest played h5. I guess he wants to take with the h-pawn, if this ever happens. And just, in general, stabilizing that knight. Hmm. I have a feeling that the situation has shifted. It's Fun Forest actually trying to play for a win now. Because e4, e5, e6 does not strike me as a real threat because this f pawn is holding that whole formation up. And you can't really pass this, push this pawn through because this bishop on d7 is a great blockader. So Fun Forest has 10 minutes against 24. But I don't know. I feel that this is advantage and it's much easier to play for Fun Forest. It's advantage Fun Forest and it is better for him. So this looks like a problem. What could what could Fabi do? So this knight is out of play. Maybe it's an idea to bring it back. Could go knight a5, knight c6, or knight d6. If I would go knight d6, that would be mostly against bishop f5 moves. But if I go here, there's king e7, and then the bishop can actually achieve what it wanted to achieve in the first place. Maybe knight e4, and if bishop f5, knight g3, hitting both the pawn and the bishop. But somehow this doesn't strike me as convincing. Because suddenly my knight will have a good spot on c5. This knight will get passive from that b7 square if it drops to g3. Um, it's a way to fight, but I'm not convinced this is the best way of playing. Just bringing the knight back. Plan number two, knight a5, just trying to get that knight to c6. And that could be interesting as well. So b4 was played, and I don't like b4. Because Caruana is trying to forcefully get rid of pawns, but that might be just forcing himself into a worse endgame. Rook c4, hitting both of those pawns. If b5, probably I have knight c7 and pick up a pawn. But I hear that there is artificial castling coming up in Duda Artomyov. What? I don't know where the artificial castling is coming, but checkmate might be in the air as well. So let's track back a little bit. Whoa, so... These structures are usually good for white. 
I know it's an isolated pawn, but because of the passive nature of the black pieces, white can go for a big attack. So queen c8, bishop to h6. The point is if you take, I take with my queen, you can't ever block with bishop f5, but I have rook g5, rook g7, I mean queen g7 checkmate, and there's no way you can defend against this. King h8, if king h8, I even have this cute little move rook h5, my rook is obviously a taboo, if you take its mate, and if you would run and hide to defend, well, my friend, you're too late. This queen takes h7, checkmate. That is a cutie, that is a cute one. So g takes h6 is not to be advised, so Artemyov is going to bring an extra piece to cover up all the weaknesses. So therefore, Duda is bringing some extra attackers. If you take, I'll get my rook in the attack. So Artemyov is trying to chase that bishop away, but you can't really ask Duda to do so. He goes bishop takes g7, just crashing through. Knight takes. If knight takes g7, I have the same idea and queen h6. I have a double attack and that attack is going to be decisive. Knight e4, knight g7, queen h6, rook g4. Now the question is what happens after f takes g? F takes. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, Tsutsuwang TV, thank you for the for rating with a party of 10. Hope you had a good stream. You're just looking at this wild, wild attack between Duda and Artomyov. F takes. So the big problem we have is the king is going to take a long walk. And if Artemyov manages to do that, you're in trouble. But I think we have uh, two, we don't have knight g5 because bishop takes. Rook takes. So probably we have to agree to that walk. Now this would be nice taking away that square. Here I would have bishop f5 and then queen h7 ideas. But the problem is bishop g5, rook g5. Hmm, maybe this is the better one. And now I have threats here. If you go there, I can take and rook g7. I mean, it's even mate. But even if you block, Maybe rook f7 is better, because I can run away with e7 and king d8. And again, that's going to be a home run. That's something that you wouldn't want. Hello, trolls are. Hey, bonkinator. And probably the king would run away. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. F takes, I still think that this is critical. This is still an idea, but I have second thoughts. Takes, I could take here, I could take this way. So I can capture that knight, but that's not like a big deal because I'm down 50 pieces. So rook f7 and the king walks away and I'm down the whole rook. So that's a no-go. It is, this is the Tata Steel event. F takes. Rook G5. I could take, Knight takes, and there's just Bishop F5. Killing all play. Hmm. 
knight g5, bishop takes, so here Duda played this with spending 13 minutes on this move. Hmm. Chat, would you take this rook if you were black? I'm trying to find a move here. Takes. I could take here. Here. King f6 is not that good. I'll take maybe. Queen h4 doesn't win, does it? Queen h4, there's king g6. That's the only move. Is there increment? I don't think so, but they have an extra edit time at move 40. Rook 8, Queen H4, King G6. And it's kind of unbelievable. I don't see a win here. Because if you hear, you go here, I just casually walk back to G8 and nothing happens. Also, this is a problem. Maybe bishop takes. Rook takes. Gf, maybe queen g6 is an idea. But even there, even there, I'm not sure how you're going to win. Because I can just take the bishop and you don't have any forces left to win. Okay, so fg. FG. Knight G5. I think I just take you. Takes rook f7 and just walking the king away. And I'm just up way too many material. So chat, uh, chess sweep chat is suggesting rook h5. Ah, so there's no knight h5 because queen h7 is checkmate. How can I defend? So rook f7 is an idea just to evacuate the king. Bishop f5. f5. Even bishop f5, I'm not sure. If here, I can just casually hide my king. If takes, I take, and again I run. And again, I have all these knight jumps would win the game. Muni says in ch uh, uh, chat, not sure if Artemiov is really to win, but I guess Duda is really going to lose. Bishop f6, actually rejecting it. Interesting. I honestly would have taken. I feel that this still... I I'm doubtful that there's anything. So probably he got scared that there's something there. Bishop f6, knight g5, bishop takes, rook g5. And let's promote this guy. Probably rook f7. This is still up a, up a whole piece. Mm, can you do anything? Maybe rook e3, rook g3 is a plan. You can't ever go f4 because now that'd be too much. You're not up a whole rook. Hmm. I guess I'll hide my king. Here, rook e7. Maybe I have this funny plan of rook g4. Here, you can't take because it's checkmate. 
And if you move your knight, then you only like basically open up Pandora's box. You shouldn't. And then I have rook h4 and mate. Huh. So maybe this is still dangerous. So maybe f takes the brave move was the best. And now I could maybe maybe rook f7 is not as good. Because this, the, that's bad, obviously. But this does kind of strike me as an annoying plan. So probably queen d7. And I like these type of moves. This is a very korchnoi esque way of playing chess. You're defending your guys, but you're always preparing something interesting and brave in nature. So the plan would be to take on d4. Bishop f5 doesn't work because I take back, but I can try rook a6 here. Whoopa! Bishop b3. I still have king h8. Wow, and that works by a miracle. So rook takes g7 is an idea, and going for this, how many pawns we have? Not enough. This is better for black. Because I have an active rook. Pressure everywhere. Is this playable for white? Yes, but I think black is better. But bishop b3 obviously is the question. But king h8. And this knight will do a pirouette. Again, if you take, I just exchange everything and I'm up in exchange. Here. I can't take this way because queen g7 checkmate, knight e6, and this knight is suddenly defending everything, and you're gone. Hello, Duce Mano, how's it going? Hello, Plukra. We're just looking at this fascinating. And Queen D7 was played. Wow. Channeling the Korchnoi. Channeling the Korchnoi. And Korchnoi is rarely wrong when it comes to aggressive counterplay and defensive play. And I don't see it. I don't see it. D5. This looks a little bit um, desperate. If bishop D5, then there's bishop F5, which is cool and pretty good. You can't take here because I take on E8. And then I just win the whole house. And if you don't capture on F5, I'm going to take either the queen or take everything. On the second, se seventh rank. There is bishop a4. I don't get it. So I feel bishop d5, bishop f5. This must be lost. So c takes d5. Should be played and was played. C takes d5. Okay, so now the big problem for white is that he's running out of energy. You can't sack, so probably g4. You would want this rook over here, but you can't get there. Probably let's go crazy now and play g4. Hmm. Because gf is a threat. FG is suicide because I take everything and it's actually it's made in two. You don't want that. G4. My threat is GF, so it's kind of clear. Takes takes. G4 might be brutal actually. This could be this could be the move. If you go bishop a4, 
I'm not, I don't think I'm scared. You can win that, I don't care. If you take here, I take. And I have two pieces, that's good enough on Grandmaster level. I think this is fine. I, I'm more curious about G4 here. Can this work? This might work. Here, here, here. I take, you must take. Oh, it does. It just barely doesn't. Does it? Because he, I could take on e8. You don't have knight h6 because checkmate. Oh, don't go there. Come back. Engage 8. Here, here, here. Takes, takes. You can't take with the rook because it's mate. You can't take because it's mate. Queen takes e8 is the only move. But it wins because you cover both, both the g7 and the f6 square. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I'm not quite sure that I'm convinced. It's gf. Bishop f5. And the funny thing is knight f5 would lose because of this. Takes. And if you take this way, you're made it. If you take this way, you're made it. So this works magically. So bishop f5 is the only move. Or bishop g8, maybe. Defending. Bishop f5. Rook e8. Ah, rook e8. And you can't take with the queen now because queen g7 checkmate. If you take with the rook, I take here, here. Ah, but you have back. Ah, what a near miss. What a near miss. But I do feel that g4 looked a bit more menacing. Yeah, bishop f5. Oh, but bishop a4 now. Huge difference, huge difference. Because I'm having threats. Queen f7, and I have all of my guys playing. Takes, rook takes, rook takes. So takes, if you take, oh. Look at that. Look at that. So maybe g4. I have a feeling g4 was something to try. And combining the two ideas, so Duda was not wrong, but I feel if you combine this, put this bishop to a more vulnerable position, now bishop a4. And now bishop e8 is, I think, winning. You can't take, because it's mate. You've got to move it. Takes. You can't take with the knight, because rook f5 wins. I'm winning everything. And if you take that, as just shown before, this checkmate. b5 doesn't help you, because I just collected. Now you could consider taking, but because I have such a big threat everywhere, now you can end the pin, but you need, still don't have enough defenses on these guys. This is just completely winning. Wow. This is crazy. Isn't it incredible, Martin is in 41, right? It's just beautiful. Let's try to defend. Bishop g8 was actually one of my ideas. But now again, bishop a4 makes a lot of sense. I could go f6 actually too. Both of these look dangerous. Like extremely dangerous. Oh, I can go here? Again, you can't take. And... 
Instead of taking here, I can just go rook g7, hitting your queen, takes, 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 and take, and I'm up pawns. Rook f7, okay, let me check. Rook f7 when? Martin then. GF, yeah. So far I think that we found the g4 move. Probably would have been definitely the move to play. And then it would be just good. G4. If you go rook f7 now, I go gf. And then I just have too much pressure. Maybe a counterattack on the queen side. Huh. G4, queen, c7, suggested by Chet. Ah. So you're actually not threatening taking here. But you're th threatening mostly to take on e5. I just have rook e6. And you can't ever take there. And if you take, I take with my queen. And just drop back. But okay, so bishop a4 happened. I think g4 was a big idea. Queen f7 takes. Rook takes. Ah, so... He chose a different line and felt that this is cleaner, which makes sense. He took, took, takes. This is a very nice move. Rook takes, and suddenly you don't have a defender. I remove your defender on e6. He gets into this endgame. Let's count pawns here. Three, three. So maybe I'm not thrilled. Maybe I'm still with g4. I'm team g4. You're not threatening to take on c2 because you get checkmated in the other line, in the g4 variation. Here we have same amount of material and black actually has a passer. I don't think that this is going to be a win for Duda. <clears throat> Maybe I could, if I check here, so if I check, go here, here, I can go queen f6 and then promote my pawn. I don't think that's going to be too dangerous for Artomyov. Um, if queen e5, queen d4, that makes sense. Maybe just a6 here, and I'm just going to walk my king up. I don't think that this is going to be that dangerous. Oh! So what Duda is saying that this endgame is winning. Or at least good for him. So Artemyev has two minutes, Duda has eight. It's possible. Let's see. Let's see. So white is planning to walk up the king to d4 and then just create a passer and then win that way. Yeah, they'll receive extra time, Abel Crumb. Hello, URT. So. King e6, king e2. Want to stop those pawns? Hmm. Okay, so king e6, king e2. This is kind of annoying for Artemio. Even sometimes when you know this is fine or you think it's fine. 
when he had no time left. He had five moves, and in pawn end games, like we don't consider uh, pawn end games to be that sharp, but this is very sharp. Just imagine that your opponent has a simple plan of going this side, go f4, g4, and just go straight to the end game, and you have one minute on the clock. That's not fun. That's actually very bad news. Martin Den 41, thank you for following. Also, everyone who's just following, you can take a look at our Discord if you so want to join us. The Chassvee, that channel that is. Now, let's stick to this one because it is a pawn endgame. And Artemyov is under huge pressure. But then, probably we're going to take a look at Anand's game against Jeffrey. Or whichever chat you'd like me to take a look at. Anand is winning. Interesting. But I want to stick to this one because people don't realize how sharp these games are. Thirty seconds. So I would be considering moves like h5, just starting to stop g4. But the problem is king e3. And when you go king e5, I can play f4 and have the d4 square under my control forever. The question is if there is b6 stopping any breakthroughs. So let's say king e5. Here, king d6. And often, black can build a fortress like this, because we take away those two squares. But instead, he decided to play f4 on three seconds, I think, because he got 33 seconds right now. f4. So he's trying to push white back. Also, if king d3, king e5, the point is he does not want white to build an f4, g4 passer, on the king side, and also blocking that with his own pawn. Yeah, probably in the previous line that I was showing, probably black would hold there, but it wasn't forced by any stretch. King d3. And now it's getting tricky, because if you go g3, I'm not actually worried about you taking because my king will be so active. Probably the worry is more of g4. Because as we talked about it, I, if I manage to give up these pawns for these, then I'm just having a technically winning endgame. So king d3, king e5, g4, and just start pushing those pawns. Maybe f3, I have king e3, just gobbling it up. And now white will try to go h4, g5. But okay, let's take a look at the Anand game, because we haven't looked at this one. Whoa, lots of transformation. So we left it off around here, knight e6, queen e2. And it seems that Jeffrey did stabilize, but that was for a cost of a pawn. In b1, Jeffrey is still trying to get active. Whoa, what a sack. Wow, rook d4 is nice. Bishop takes, takes. But sadly for Jeffrey, this is going to be a protected pass pawn, which is never a good sign. So rook g4, f4, rook g3, rook g5, takes, rook f8. And d6. And yet, the pawn count is equal. But the problem is that after f5, e6 is going to happen. That is just going to be a big problem. Now, f5 wouldn't be working just yet because rook a5, and I can check you and take the e6 pawn. But there's like this big difference between the a7 and b6 pawn compared to the d6 e5 one. These pawns are just stronger. Just much, much stronger. So the problem is, black 
cannot make progress with these pawns. But as Chet suggested, to be more specific, Blocroix suggested rook a5 to stop the pawns. But as suggested by Chet, rook e7 is strong. Now king d8 would lose the pawn. You've got to go f8. But then I can play f5 and this is completely winning. And that's going to be a big win. f6 is coming and the problem is the following. I go f6 and I don't even care about promoting both pawns. Your king is cut off. And I'm just going d7, rook e8 and queen. And there's nothing you can do about it. So this looks like crushing for Anand, and it's a big comeback. He just lost a few rounds ago to Wesley, and this is going to be upping his mood. So f5 is coming. e6 is in the on the cards, but f6, d7 is probably just nailing the game. And Anand won. So let's go back to the featured game between Duda and Artomyov. He left off with king e6, f4, and g4 was played with the same idea. So the pro point is, if g3, black could go for something like king f5 of sorts, because if there's two h pawns still left on the board, Black can play for counterplay on the with the h pawn that is. But after g4, f takes, f takes. This is very, very unnerving for Artemyov. He still has three moves to make, and there's still trouble brewing. This is very, very uncomfortable for Artemyov. Let's take a look at the Firusha game because we've been neglecting this one for a while when we shouldn't be. So let's track back a little bit because we stopped at here. So I said that Firusha wanted this very good maneuver, but Anish did a good job at creating good play against those knights. Knight king h1, bishop f4. So Firuja was anticipating bishop f4, moved the king away, queen c5, and this is a good move. After he stabilized his pieces, he is aiming to exchange stuff. Now, even though black has the bishop pair, he still has to struggle with those pawns, and note that these bishops are in danger right now. So you can defend three things the same time, not even talking about four things, because the b7 pawn's hanging, the d4 is hanging, and you're in a potential skewer. Bishop c2, bishop rook takes d4, takes another double attack. Bishop e3, and now I'm skewering these guys. So you can take my bishop, but then I take on c5. Knight e6, bishop g6. Rook f3, bishop h6, you're just heading closer to the position. Rook e8 takes, and a king f2. Now, in fact, this position is, I think, ten, maybe tenable for Firuja, but is definitely advantage Giri. Why? Well, the king is quick to jump to f5, and then he can take on e5. And this might look similar to the game between Duda and Artomyov. But it's actually a little bit different because black actually has an extra pawn on the queen side. So let's say here, here, here. Let's say here. You can't really go this direction because I will start pushing my extra pawn and you're still far away from creating a passer on this side of the board, let's say here. And this is just taking way too much time while I'm just ready to roll with my C pawn. So rook a4 was played for that reason. He's trying to get this h pawn for the e pawn, which I would say that, you know, even though slightly better for Anish, because the 
King is a little bit better than this one. After let's say King F5, then I have this takes. But let's say I just make some moves. This King is cut off. This King is defending this pawn on H7. And I have some potential chances of pushing my pawns. But to be honest with you, I don't think that this will be anything else than a draw. Because it is still a rook end game. I don't think that this will be anything more than a draw. Let's say here, here. And there's a potential repetition going on. Not necessarily, but I don't think that this should amount to more than that. But let's go back to the Duda game. F takes, king e5, king e3. Opposition, one of the key factors in, in the game. D4, king f3. And now, black is in trouble. You can't push the pawn, because now I capture you and I'm winning. And other than that, you'll be condemned to wait. Maybe you could try to go for h5, though. If you're just sitting and waiting, I will just start pushing my pawns. If you go here, I go here, chase you away. I'm still in the box. So I'm within the box and I'm going to reach your pawn. You can't really do damage to my guys. Can you? Actually, you can now. That's no good. So that's a g4 here, here. D3, H4 here. So what black would be trying to do is go here and try to gobble up, up the pawns. This would actually still be a draw. Because I can... I can move my king up. Thanks. Yep, the king f3, king f5 actually was played. All right, so let's promote this. Oh, let's delete this line. Okay, king f5. If h4, I have h5, and then the position's fixed. The so g4 was played. I assume king g5. If you go this direction, I'll go ahead and attack your pawns. Actually, I'm not quite sure that this is over yet. Not sure if this is over yet. King g5. If you go here, I'll go this way. King g3. d3 check. King f6. I think this is not over. King g5. Black King is just very strong. Wow. If this is going to be a draw, that's great defense. He was defending on his last seconds, people. Last seconds. King G3, D3. H4, King F6. I can't go forward because that pawn is quick. If you go here, then my King will... Start taking pawns. So I think, as far as I can see, Artemiovis has saved it. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's cool. That's cool. So that's why it's important to have active play in the endgame. Your king is very important. And he compensated this d pawn weakness with an active king. As far as I can see, h4, king, f6, there's not much you can do about that. And it's just going to be a draw. Because this king will have to go for this pawn. And we'll just be in due time to defend the g5 one. So I, I think this should be a draw. 
with perfect play. So they just reached time control. So we'll check back to this one. But let's take a look at the far beginning. Ah, so this was a draw. Go back here. G4. Queen F4. Queen E5. Takes, takes. H5. B4. So Fabi in this position, we kind of stopped here. We were wondering if we either want to get the knight activated or bring it back as a defender. He decided to go for b4 and exchange off the pawn. b5 takes a4. Probably I would have liked knight c7. I would have wanted to win the pawn and keep more pieces on the board. Knight c7, knight c5 compared to knight c7 exchanges way more pieces takes a4 and here he offered a draw which was accepted by von forest which is okay um white has enough pawns but if he would have wanted to he could have fenced playing on king e7 but i think that objectively this should be still fine for caruana with the right defense no, in, indeed, Fabi was better in the opening, but uh, then it kind of didn't work out. And good defense by Fon Forest made sure it was a draw. Okay, so that's so Anand won the game against Jeffrey, which we just saw. Vesli drew against Kovalyov. In this game, it was not a big event. Vesley was defending a slightly worse position, but nothing very decisive nor exciting. Duda is still playing. Now we're waiting for d3, h4, and this maneuver. Vitugov ended in a draw. This was just very peaceful endgame which led to a draw so we have Carlson drawing we have Karana drawing Anand won and we have I think two games left as Vitugov drew Kovalyov drew and we have Firuja playing Giri so as I said to you before dear viewer and future viewer, rook e4. Probably Anish agreed with me a little bit that he's not going for the draw just yet. He's aiming to win this e5 pawn and get into an endgame with the queenside pawn majority. That is his big plan in this type of position. Takes rook e5. Oh, rook e5 I can take there. Excuse moi. King takes e5, of course. Delete. So here, here. And I do have this passer. So this is not exactly very similar to the game that we saw in the other game, but it's not the same. Trolls are saying, Anish not going for the draw. What? Nani? Well, I think he feels that he might get some extra chances in this type of position. Rook h4 was just played. Oh, what? Oh. Did I just delete that? Okay, so rook h4 was played. And I mean, I still don't expect anything more than a draw. Still probably going to be a draw. But... Um, I I think that Anish is still trying to, you know, press a little bit. But okay, let's go back to the more exciting one. So h4, d3, h4 here. I go closer, king e5 here. You give up the pawn, king f4, g5 here. I'm here in due time. Hmm. 
So you're not going to win on this side of the board. The question is, can you push here? And if that does make a difference. Okay, so king f3 was played. We're still in this position. e5 takes. So if we just make random moves, I'm in due time as far as I can see to capture. And then it's a draw. Yeah. But my question is, if I can make some useful moves in this position with white. But actually, we are heading there. So let's just follow the game. I think they're going that direction right now. So we have, let's just take a look at the leaderboard. We have... Wesley leading with three and a half. And if Duda were to win, he would have three points. So, so far, Wesley still in the commanding lead, but Anand is climbing back. Jeffrey's in good position. Fun Forest in Caruana is just a half be point behind Wesley. That's kind of surprising. So, King e3. King f4. So this is still my question. If white can improve with say b4, b5. And that's the question. If that's winning, then this position is winning as well. Note that if you go here, I can go here. And there's no h6 because I promote. Let's say you wait. b4. B4, B5 takes. So B4 is going to be critical. Here, B4. My point is if you keep waiting, at the right moment I go G6. And let's say... I go g6 and then you don't have a target on the other side of the board and I win. And the question is if you can stop me somehow. Or if you have a perfect formation with, with white. I mean for black. Okay, king f4. So we are here. You just reached this position. The question if black has a perfect formation here or is it just gone? King f4, b4, so I'm thinking. I could get that pawn up to b5. There, there. A6. Six. six takes. So the question, what I'm kind of trying to figure out is here, here. Is what would be the perfect defensive system for black? But probably there is nothing as such. Hmm. Yeah, this is a very an interesting. Both endgames are very interesting. But I heard that there's some drama going in the Firuja game. So it actually they actually transposed into this endgame. And they say that this is actually great for Firuja. Which I, I would have thought that this wouldn't be the case.
So again, the same thing with the Firuja game. If Firuja manages to get this king over and get his pawns, so just lure this king away and start gobbling these pawns, then he's winning. Question is, how will he do that? So Engine is asked, and Spice is asking, why does my stockfish always give plus 1.5 in the end game? Because they're lazy to calculate it, but it's still an advantage. Also, it's probably not in the depth that it could state that, okay, this is just wonderful. Yeah, Plokro has a good point. It's a pawn endgame. It's either a win or a draw. That's the 1.5 evaluation. Kind of. Okay, let's check back to the other one because I think that's very interesting. So A3, so they're saying, Artemiov is saying, this is my perfect formation. A3. Go here, king f5. And black would love to stay here forever, but can't. Eventually, we'll have to play king h4. Or weaken the structure. Play b6. Ah, maybe he's not trying to go... King h5. Let's go b4. So because of king f5, maybe I could go king g3 and win some tempi. Because after you go king f6, I go king f4 and hitting this pawn. b3. So king f5 was played. a5, b3, king h3, king f3, and probably, so king h3 was a nice move. Instead of going this way, which probably is not smart, he's trying to win the time whenever white plays king f5, king g3, and then he actually gains 10 piece compared to being in on h4. So that's why he's kind of lurking around h3 instead of h5. 3, king h4, and the game was drawn. Because of this king h3 move, and then the king would have been much closer in game drawn. Let's go back to the Firuja game. Duda, I think that that g4 idea was very interesting. Not all draws, Evelyn. It's actually a win by Anand against Jeffrey Jean in the French, the Vendaver. Let's take a look at this position. Even in these type of endgames, try to draw this box. So if your king is close enough, or it can even be moved up the board a little bit, then your king is safe. So there's unlikely to be a passer that direction. So let's think about pushing the pawn. King e4 makes sense. Nacho. Yeah, Duda didn't win. Duda did not win. So we can go king e4, but I'm kind of thinking that we should eventually start pushing those pawns. Because that's the key for any attempts to win. G4, what would be the best defense? If king f6, king f4, and the problem for Giri that he doesn't really have a fortress. So let's say g4, king f6, king f4. This is something that we always love to do in the endgame. 
that thing that is just so lovely. Opposition. And now I will have H4. Problem for black is that did H6 actually you're helping white? I could maybe even go B4, just hindering this C5 idea. But now G5 is just going to be a winner move. Because let's say you play C5. Takes, takes there, takes there, here. I'm just going to go ahead and gobble up all your pawns. So this is no good. So I assume g4, king f4, h4 is going to be played. And what's very important is a for Firuja to decide if he wants to play b4. Actually, b4 might make sense. So let's say instead here, just play b4. And just go for break later with h4. The point is you want to fix these pawns as quickly as possible and then run for it and take all those pawns on the queen side. That is something that you're trying to do. Hello there, Z Nation. We're just looking at some fine little end games. And again, don't forget to note that this king can go as far as f5, let's say, even here, because whenever you go here, my king is still in the box. So this pawn can't really make a run for it. And that's something that's important to note, because I'll be there in two moves. And if I can just catch that pawn, I'm just winning. So Troza saying Sessa says white mates in 27, and I'm not surprised because white is going to create a pass pawn on the king side, and then is just going to go the other direction. And this is going to be a big win for Firuja, especially after that numbing loss against Wesley So. And then probably he can get back into the game suddenly. Which is surprising. So, so far... Chat, what's your opinion? Who are you most impressed with this whole Tata Steel tournament? Masters. Honestly, I have many heroes this event. I'm kind of impressed with many, many players. Yeah, Ali Reza is just calculating it out. You are saying Firo is an, as a newcomer. Okay. Fun Forest, yeah, I kind of agree. Fun Forest is kind of overlooked, but Fun Forest has been doing great. And he's just a great, great player. Drawing Carlson, holding Karana with black, that's very impressive. Hey, Omid, nice to see you. So we're just looking at the last game of round five. And um, by the way, I am going to do some continue Tata Still commentary tomorrow as well. So if you want to be notified about that, here's our link at the social media. You can check out announcements in Discord or on Facebook. I post it in both places. So if you're interested and you like this chess channel, Leave a follow or sub, whichever tickles your fancy. So right now I feel this is probably going to be an easy win for Firuja. Still calculating. When will I play a tournament? That's still up in the air. I hope some Grandmaster tournaments in the future. Not 
too far from the future, that is. But it is still, still not decided yet. How it is decided? Invitations, timing. Um, there's many things that comes to tournaments. Yeah, so I feel that uh, this will be a huge win for Firuja if he makes it. Shouldn't be hard. Shouldn't be hard at all. Let's see what, what that would do to Firuja's ranking. Let me even check that out and post it in chat. So, um, Tata Steel, Tata Steel Chess. Rankings, Masters, Standings. So Wesley is leading with three and a half, but Firuja is just going to jump back into the leaderboard with this win. Wow, he will have three and a half. Wow, so he's still back at it and could actually be a big force. Here's the link, by the way. And beating Anish, by the way, and that's kind of a big feat. He's doing really, really good. Yeah. Let me take a look. King e7. Yeah, I do think that this is just going to be a win, as we kind of predicted it. Um... And you can't really go the other side of the board, because I can. My pawns are just way faster than yours. And I might even fancy bringing my king over. So if you go here, even going king g5 and king h6, king h7 is an idea. So honestly, I feel that this is basically decided. King g5, then I have this maneuver, and then I push. And if you don't do that, I'll just push my pawns up the board. Play b4. Make sure that you don't have a break on the other side with c5s. And then after that, my king is just going to make a break for it. So Firuja is actually going to jump up the leaderboard. Same points as Wesley So. And it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating tournament in the future. So, I don't know. Firuja has been impressing. So many players impressing here. Firuja is great, but Fun Forest has been showing some wonderful chess as well. So Plokra, yes, he could play, let's say, b4. Okay, let's play a move, b4, b6, c5. Well, actually, you're not trying to be playing on the queen side. Because if you break, I'll take, take, and then I'll run my king over. And right now, I have all of these squares protected. But after c5, I will have this entry square on d5 which you don't want to give me. Let's say h4, here, 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 king e4. Now I have this entry square. When you're going this way, I'll go g5. And I don't think you're in time. There it takes sticks. Yeah, you're just not in time. So let's say here, here, takes takes. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you don't have enough time to go to c8. One, two, three, four, five. And you don't have these important squares. So here, here, here. And you just don't have control of any of these squares. And I just push. And I'm winning. 
So, as you can see, it is very likely to be a Fiorugia win, which will be big news as he will be up on the leaderboard. So, once again, thank you for watching. Do check out our socials if you're interested in the upcoming commentary. I will start again around 9 9 a.m. Oh. CT. So do tune in if uh, you see that on Discord or on Facebook or just leave a follow so you know when I go live. And before we go, here, raiding. We're going to raid. Lile Koridze. So stay tuned for the raid. And I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you all. Hope to see you back tomorrow as well. So have fun. And I hope you enjoyed this stream. Take care.